Age of Empires 4 will come soon, in fall 2021, with eight playable civilizations, for example England, the Mongols, China of the Ming Dynasty and the Delhi Sultanate in India. With skirmish battles, multiplayer matches for up to eight players and with four solo player campaigns. In one of them with the glorious Battle of Hastings, 1066, when William the Conqueror seized the throne of England. I'm writing Bull. I am doing Twitch streams and YouTube videos about PC strategy games in German and especially previews and presentations together with the developers of those games. I've already published a detailed preview video of Age of Empires 4, which you can find in my playlist there. And I had a long conversation with three leading developers of Edge of Empires 4, with creative director Adam Icegreen, narrative lead Phil Buhl and game director Quinn Duffy. Some clips of the interview are already included in my preview video special. But now and here the whole interview, uncut in English and maybe later with self-written English subtitles. Thank you for your time. For many people, the medieval times count as the Dark Age, a cliché which bases upon something that happened in Western and Southern Europe, the fall of the Roman Empire. There did not exist a strong government anymore, there was more violence, there was a declining population. Many cultural benefits of the Romans were temporarily forgotten. Outside of Europe there was more positive progress in many cases. Which picture of the medieval times do you draw in Age of Empires 4? So Age of Empires 4 is a celebration of history and all these different cultures. So we draw on all those points of view. Um, we do use the term Dark Age for uh, a game phase, for the f opening part of play in a multiplayer or a skirmish match. And that's largely because it helps uh, with the, the sort of narrative arc of a typical Age of Empires game, where you start in a small village and then grow out to a, a sprawling empire. Um, and also it's a term that was used in Age of Empires 2, uh, so is a you know a familiar place for players to start. Historically, the term you're right is a cliche, um, and we you know through our campaigns, through the historical films we go through, uh, I think we show that the you know the early Middle Ages were a time of great creativity, of great um, flourishing in all kinds of different cultures. Uh, both in Europe and in Asia and elsewhere in the world. If we think about the medieval times here in Europe, then of course we think about the European medieval times. In which direction do you call the attention towards the Age of Empires IV? Which stories from foreign cultures do you tell with your game about the life of the people in foreign cultures, about the way they fight, about the reasons why they fight, and what for? Well, each culture we bring forward all the, you know, the wonderful elements of that sieve, including how they fight, but also what the story of their civilization is, what their great accomplishments were. Now, we've only revealed four of the eight sieves that we will have at ship and only one of the four campaigns. Uh, but you can see that, you know, we're dealing with the English in Europe, but also the Mongols, the Chinese, the Delhi Sultanate. These are all cultures that thrived uh, in this period and all in different ways. And we've sort of leaned in to really celebrate what makes each of these cultures unique and that time um, in history. The release of the last Age of Empires that takes place in the medieval times was about 20 years ago, a long time, and meanwhile there was a lot of public cultural discussion, for example about the question in which way Western societies estimate exotic cultures or about wrong cliches. Is Age of Empires IV different to Age of Empires II referring to these questions? Could you please give us some examples? Well, 20 years have passed, and you're right, the conversations uh, in historical circles and cultural circles have evolved, and we absolutely needed to acknowledge that. 
Uh, so we worked with historians, cultural experts, linguists, uh, medieval weapon experts um, across a variety of disciplines to really celebrate these cultures, bring forward the, you know, the, the positive and amazing aspects of cultures, be they European or non-European. Um, our, you know, our idea is to expose the breadth of culture and history that exists in this period. Um, and so people across the world can see connections to their everyday lives and discover cultures they're not necessarily familiar with yet. It is not always possible to combine historical correctness and to enjoy the game. If there was a problem, for which side did you go? If possible, please give us some examples too. So it really depends on the circumstance, right? So um, we definitely wanted to, you know, we're a game, so we absolutely have to be gameplay forward when we're talking about moment to moment gameplay, right? So, you know, people have to be able to understand what the units do. They have, there has to be balance between the sieves in a, in a multiplayer circumstance. Um, you know, the, the, You know, we, we need to lean into that celebratory aspect. But then when we do the campaign and we use these wonderful documentary films and supporting historical materials, that allowed us to really discuss um, other trends and deal with the, the broader culture. You know, my favorite way that Age of Empires sort of celebrates these things that aren't necessarily at the center of gameplay is all the nods that it gives to the everyday lives of people. You know, in the game, you may, you know, you finally get to the fourth age and you're able to bring out your counterweight trebuchet and you're able to bring down walls and that feels great. And you just build a trebuchet and you fire it. Um, you know, we're able to provide some context to really go into what an engineering marvel a counterweight trebuchet is. and how much work and labor goes into that castle wall or goes into, you know, what building a cathedral and what it really meant for those people. So by providing those bits of context, when you're in the game and, you know, you, you quickly build out a stone wall and you add towers and stuff, there's in the back of your mind, there's this sense that, wow, this is a whole sort of generation of people who are working on this. Um, and that's really the approach we wanted to take. We're not sacrifice, you know, gameplay has to come first when you're in the moment to moment gameplay, but then it's the job of the rest of the game to provide that context. Age of Empires, The Rise of Rome was my first computer game. My first computer game that I have ever played. I'm now a 58 years old man from Germany and at that time my little brother said to me, here is a game, an experience which is interested for you. And yes, Age of Empires 4 has affected me. I have compared all RTS games that I have played afterwards with this game. Other players made similar experiences, younger ones perhaps with Age of Empires 2, the first medieval game from your brand. Each Age of Empires develops the line further and causes changes. That is your freedom as developer. But is this freedom limited? Is there a core of the games of this brand that you are not allowed to change? Because otherwise your fans would accuse you to destroy the core, the soul of Age of Empires. Um, I'll, I'll start with that one. Absolutely, yes. Um, there is a core to Age of Empires that we wanted to make sure that we um, delivered uh, both on the World's Edge side and on the Relic side for Age of Empires 4. Um, it was very important to us to maintain certain aspects and elements that we all discuss and believe that make Age of Empires great. And we had those discussions with our community as well because we wanted to ensure that we could make a, a tremendously good Age of Empires game. And a lot of that stuff, it, it ranges, right? Um, you can see in uh, the trailer and in the preview uh, footage, you know, we have classically four resources, very similar to uh, what we've had in Age 2. And, you know, Age 3 modified that slightly, but um, we, it was important to us. There are mechanics and, and behaviors and the way villagers work 
all of these elements kind of build up to make Age of Empires um, what it is. And so we had to look at every single one of those those elements. And you're right, we, we weren't free to just do whatever we wanted to do. But that's okay, because we really did want to make an Age of Empires game first, right? And then um, experiment and explore the new and, and what we could do to expand Age of Empires and modernize without losing what was so special about Age of Empires. Mm-hmm. Quinn, you probably have something to add to that. Yeah, too. yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know, just just uh, I agree with what Adam said. I think you know, early on, we were also trying to to sort of push the boundaries. Like, could could this be an Age of Empires game? What if we did mm-hmm. this? Uh, and you you quickly realize that it stopped feeling like an Age of Empires game. That there's a there's a certain uh, spirit to these games that you you want to maintain. Uh, and and I think you know when we brought the community in, starting in in 2017. Uh, one of the most important metrics that uh, we were using to judge our progress was there's a questionnaire that they filled out regularly. Does this feel like a new Age of Empires game? And having that question be responded to very positively was the the key thing for us. It's like, yes, okay, we are building an Age of Empires game, but it is a new Age of Empires game, uh, and the community seemed to respond to that. It is important for RTS games that the players are able to catch the situation on the map quickly. And that is the reason why they develop some kind of automation. Does this fact set boundaries for your creativity as developers? For example, did you find cool solutions for the user interface, the UI, or for the common handling of Age of Empires 4, which you did not implement because you thought it would be better than the standard solution, but the players would not like this change? Yes, there were some of those. Um, they were mostly around automation, actually, things that... Um, we thought would be convenience features, you know, like, oh, we could we could automate um, a unit doing this in this situation. And a lot of the discussions came back to, well, no, um, or we should fix this bug, what we perceived to be a bug because of the way that the unit was behaving. And we came back from the discussion going, well, no, we could fix it. You're right. We could automate that. But if we did that, that was actually taking away player choice at that moment. And there's a certain responsibility that a, a player has to their their units and their structures that we wanted to make sure that we could maintain. So there definitely were decisions that were made that were like, no, 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 that's too too automated. That's too automatic, for especially for Age of Empires. We can't do that, right? Um, we needed to make sure that there was enough play in everything and enough game in, in every action that players could really enjoy and sink in and find. And, and, and It's not just because we wanted there to be play, but also because we wanted there to be room for mastery. So sometimes the elements that we left in were the discussions were around, well, this can be optimized. And so high level players will find a way to make this better. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to make sure that we had enough of those as well, that people could discover all of these interesting ways to optimize their gameplay. Yeah, we, we had this uh, this a phrase early called compelling work mm -hmm. that that people liked to do some of those little jobs. They wanted to task their villagers. They wanted to build the efficiency themselves rather than having some algorithm, you know, generated behind the scenes, uh, and do it for them. Uh, but we, we did end up with some things that we, we felt added some organization and structure to the game in some areas like our, on the battlefields, we use, we use formations and movement for, for sort of organizing, uh, uh, organizing and, and structuring your forces. And we have something called the battle line, you know, battle line clarity where, We wanted the, the armies to kind of meet and form a line across that you could uh, more readily identify who was who. So there, there, there are some things in there that we, we feel add some uh, additional uh, sort of uh, readability for, for the battlefield and for the players and kind of brings uh, some organization to, to what could be pretty chaotic. To the graphic style of the game, Age of Empires 4 is a RTS. Players must be able to catch new situations and developments quickly. On the other side, they expect a game which looks planned and detailed. A game that tells something about the history of the, of the special time and the cultures. That are expectations that do not always fit together in a good way. How do you manage this problem? That's a big, that's a big one. That's... <laughs> There, there's a lot of avenues of work there. Um, you know, I, I talked about some of the organization of the battlefield. That's that's one method to, that we, we try and bring some visual structure to things. 
Uh, there's a lot of effort on the art side in terms of, of scale and unit readability. And, you know, we, we artificially scaled up weapons a little bit to make them a little more readable, you know, uh, big animations so players can see what's what's going on. Uh, unit detail is a little bit lower compared to the rest of the world, just so they pop a little bit a little bit more. And obviously the sort of liberal use of, of team color so, so players can identify at a glance who's who. Um, you know, we did have some challenges, like the, you know, matching the kind of historical record with the gameplay needs, you know, we wanted to create these very unique uh, civilizations with with unique units and unique presentation, but at the same time, they need to be readable as a certain type of unit. Uh, they need to be readable as a spearman or uh, as a as a light light horseman kind of unit. So, uh, so there's some challenges there. We have to reconcile a little bit of our history with a little bit of our gameplay needs, and we use the community a lot for that. They they had a lot of feedback. Uh, around readability and, and unit scale and those kinds of things. So we've, we've spent a lot of time on that. Modern games often have smaller maps than classical strategy games. Many players do not like this because they want an epic game experience, a feeling of width and size. What limit did you choose for the size of the campaign maps and what will be the largest map in the campaigns? Well, there's uh, 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 maps can get big. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, big maps. Uh, yeah, they're they're a good size. Like <laughs> you know, uh, eight players comfortably fit on our on our largest map uh, with with plenty of space to spare. Uh, I, I we we also had an interesting challenge here because um, more casual players like space. They like space and time. They want to mm -hmm. build. They, you know, yeah, feels, they don't want to be attacked. Yeah, they, they want to feel yeah. safe. They want to build their walls, and and they play it a very different way. And and the more competitive players, they want like the smallest map possible. Like they <laughs> our our small map, uh, I think it wasn't small enough for them. So we made, I believe, we made one size smaller. Yep. Uh, at some point last year, just to to. Uh, accommodate the more competitive players so there's a wide range um, and campaign uses uh, a variety of those map sizes some are a little more intimate some are, are quite large and sweeping just depending on the on the, the story it's telling you know if you're taking a whole city you need a good size map for instance It is typical for Age of Empires that the campaigns have very different types of missions and challenges. Is this also true for Age of Empires 4? Could you tell us some examples for the diversity of the missions, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the great opportunities of building a campaign here is to really play with all the different mechanics that we have. Um, and to lean into the opportunities from history. Uh, so the Norman campaign features, you know, from uh, the Battle of Hastings, which is very much a, like you start with the battle lines and you're ready to go um, and introduces some of the unit relationships, but also, you know, gives you that historical spectacle of the Normans running up Senlac Hill to smash into the, the Saxon shield wall. Um, and then, you know, we go through a variety of mission types. You know, we have lot, Age of Empires 4 has really great siege gameplay. So we have, you know, opportunities where you get to siege cities and other opportunities where you're defending cities and then lots of hybrid um, missions. You know, there's a great mission in the Norman campaign where you're defending Dover Castle. Um, but meanwhile, you're also sending out sort of commando raids to stop the French um, and, it, you know, playing with hero gameplay there um, with, you know, some really fun, um, you know, mission variety there. You underline the fact that there are factions which require different ways of playing and special tactics. That sounds very exciting and especially RTS veterans are very happy about that. But it could be difficult for players who play RTS only occasionally. Do we have easy factions? Easy factions for occasional players? Yeah, yes. yeah, we, uh, yeah, well, we, we started with this, this idea of, of um, familiar to unexpected. So we, we wanted a few core civs that players from previous franchises would kind of uh, be able to recognize, you know, they recognize some of the units and some of the technologies and uh, would give them a comfortable starting point for access to the game. And then we went, um, you know, quite, quite asymmetrical with some of the civs. 
uh, Mongols, for instance, uh, you know, have a fully mobile uh, tech tree. Everything can pack up and move, uh, and they're all based around mobility and moving around the map and and uh, taking resources and and their the mobility from their horses and their cons and their their outposts or twos and, and those kinds of things. So. Um, very very different gameplay but the there is a simple you know let's say a simple core set of you know, of uh, civilizations that, that uh, players could kind of jump into and Adam I don't fit anything there too no I think uh, that's just right on the point right um, we tried to make sure that there were civilizations that for people that have played previous Age of Empires games that they would find easy to jump into uh, and be able to hit the ground running so to speak um, in, in getting up to speed on what was new about Age of Empires 4 versus previous Age of Empires games. But then we do have civilizations that really make you readjust your brain now. I find myself, uh, if I go between, for example, the English and the Delhi Sultanate, um, that if I don't get back into the mindset of playing the Sultanate, because it's a very different experience in terms of what you need to concentrate on, what you focus on, how you build your cities, because of all the ways and uniqueness in, in each civilization, you really do have to change your mindset as you go between civilizations. And um, yeah, the Mongols especially are one because you're like, no, go, go, run, go, go seize. And um, the fascinating thing is we've even played around with um, how much uh, certain civilizations care about certain resources. So for something like the Mongols, you saw in our preview video, um, the Ovu is depleted. Um, they really care about stone to the point where um, you kind of go around the map immediately looking for all the stone deposits in order to be able to plan out how you're going to seize them all um, because it's so critical to making the Mongols successful at doing their raiding. Um, and that changed the game dramatically, just in the fact that you don't think like you do when you play the other civs. And there's tons of examples of that across all the civilizations, um, and we're not going to spoil them all here. but. Um, there's a lot for people to sink their teeth into, and you really do have to have this mindset shift, which should be fun because I think it'll be interesting to see how players develop uh, in terms of their well, who they play, right? Do, do people become very synonymous with one civilization? Do they have a pocket sieve that they play, you know, if they feel like they need to counterpick? Um, or are they going to try to play them all? Which, wow, I'm going to be really impressed with someone that can switch sieves like this and still be on top of the ladders. Um, especially in the competitive scene. It'll be really interesting to see. Your first gameplay shows settlements and bases which are completely surrounded by walls and they show diverse attributes of the landscape. Which tactical role will the landscape play for Edge of Empires 4? Well, we've added uh, what we call stealth woods, for example, so you're, you can actually hide your units in in some of the lighter forests uh, and, and create ambushes. I think you saw in the video the Mongols rushing out to ambush uh, uh, an attacking force. Uh, and so there's um, that. that's one element and, and certain maps will have more of that or less of that. Uh, again, there's a large variety of, of maps with uh, high ground and choke points and uh, ways to control, you know, uh, uh, the, the map and you know, ingress and egress out of your out of your uh, your base area. Um, so there's a lot of of tactical play on the on the map. They're all randomly generated, which is kind of a, a hallmark of age as well. So there's mm -hmm. tons and tons of replayability, just in in I mean in any one of the the kind of the core map types. Uh, and yeah, there's uh, we we wanted maps to to factor. We wanted to be able to use uh, things like our fog of war system and stealth woods to add a new layer of gameplay. And walls add another new layer too, because there's, you know, when you have chokes, you can you can wall them off in different ways. And not only can you wall off a choke now, but you can put troops up on it, and and they can act as a defending force and and uh, watch for enemies uh, attacking. Okay, thank you, thank you for your time. Much success, good luck for the next month. So I'm looking forward to Age of Empires 4. You will get more content in upcoming previews and let's plays here on my YouTube channel and besides on Twitch. All links below. Can't wait to show you more stuff about Age of Empires 4.